So it's great to have you here, Ruben. It's good to be here. To talk about some language learning myths. So you, you mentioned that your your jacket was here to dispel some myths. What do you mean by that exactly? I don't know. Just I was just saying that this I I, uh, I found this one yesterday and I just really liked it. And I was thinking about today. I was like, I think uh, this would be appropriate to wear in the lab. I wanted to uh, to impress all the people watching with these cool color colors. Can you see it well? I hope so. It's They're pretty um, cool colors. It just um, it's what I wanted to be wearing when I talked about all these language learning myths with you. So great. So I think we should before we get delve into the topic, we should start as as always with a fact mm -hmm. about Guarani. Okay, so, <laughs> of course, because that's just what I do. Right. And today's will be that when you tell a joke or say something emotionally really powerful to someone mm -hmm. in Paraguay, if you say it in Guarani, it means much more. It's something like twice, I don't know the actual quantity, but something yeah. like twice as powerful. So it, using the, the local language, I mean. Yes, the indigenous language of, of Paraguay. The, mm -hmm. And the, you know, they say it's, it comes from the Nye'a, which is heart, you know. Mm -hmm. um, because that's that's the language that they see as you know their their core the center of their culture so it's it's important to them nice. and who knows maybe maybe that has to do with a kind of the myths tied up in culture or mainstream culture but we can talk about that in another occasion today we're talking about myths simply about relating to language learning specifically right yes. Definitely. And, you know, there's so many of them. I know that um, everybody kind of has their ideas of what it's like to learn a language in school, right? We kind of have that um, across the board. And everybody knows what it's like to have a native language. But the, um, I think it's just in general, it gets really jumbled as to, you know, what, what works, what doesn't work, you know, what are things that are actually effective versus the kind of popular societies. Um, idea of what it you know what it what it takes to go maybe past a certain level like what we're all used to because as you and i know that you know taking on a second or third or fourth language is um something that actually gets easier you know maybe people don't realize that or you know, just little things like that where you may may talk about those things all uh, with with people who are in that language space but so i think it's going to be a nice thing to talk about for us because we've seen this before we've seen lots of students in various languages and we can kind of um, observe different things about those people and i think it's going to be interesting to see what uh, what people say and how they react so if you're watching this too or people that are watching replays too feel free to comment and uh and, and just participate too because we want to See what you think about it. It's not just what we think. We we, we know from our uh, observations, but it's um, it's important to, to hear you know from from others too and to see what what we can we can all decide on. I think is or at least uh, support with evidence. So we'll see if we can do that today. Absolutely. You know, creating dialogue is one of the best ways to increase everyone's knowledge and to approach yeah. these topics in a different way. And you know, it's actually a great way to question myths and dispel myths, simply asking questions about it, thinking about it. So we do, we read questions after the fact and we answer them and we love continuing this discussion. You know, we, after yeah. a certain amount of time, we have to end it because we can't just sit here all day, but sure. we want to keep going. We always want to keep going. <laughs> so speaking, you know, things that keep going, perpetuate, continue, a lot yeah. of myths, do exactly that mm -hmm. you know they mm -hmm. they originate from some place we can talk about where they originated at some point but they originate from some place kind of get a foothold in popular culture and then everyone seems to start to believe them and if you check mm -hmm. your sources you have one source confirming another without any either source actually having any real evidence except they confirm each other with something false, mm -hmm. and that makes it seem, oh, it's real because this source says it, and the other source cites the first source. So you know that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't prove anything. If two people lie, 
and have the same story, that doesn't make their story true necessarily. Right. So it's like, where do you get your information from? How do you, well, who do you trust? How do you know where to, you know, to where to get the most valuable uh, or like honest resources for, for that? It's true. Yeah, it's, it's always hard to know who to trust. Well, <laughs> that's a different, that's a different lab, I suppose. Absolutely. Let's not go into that who today. Do <laughs> who do you trust? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who do you trust? But how do some of these myths get started? Where do they come from? What do you think, Ruben? I mean, it's, it's tough to say. Obviously, there's, um, there are people that just don't really question things. I think that, that a lot of times in life, you get a job, you kind of do your job, and then you don't really, um, unless you're that kind of person, you don't really change, you don't really aim to, to, to get better because you know what you're doing, you're doing your job. And it's why a lot of doctors and lawyers and a lot of other professionals and teachers especially have to refresh their knowledge and stay updated because there's people that are continuing to practice the old ways and, the, and they're believing certain things from the past. And it's a really great thing to always, I mean, now that we do, we do this, surely we're, I'm preaching to the choir right now, but to, you know, to not um, want to get better and improve and, at, and try to find the, the best answers to your questions um, is rare, I think, too. And so people, I find that uh, it's kind of become complacent and don't, you know, make an effort to, to, to look for the, the right answers and to, to observe the right people and find the right evidence to, to support what the, what's, what's really true. And so it's, it's easy to kind of just believe what you've always believed and, and stick with what the first thing you've heard about it was or uh, anything that hasn't been re, um, or hasn't been countered or hasn't been uh, contradicted in your life, right? Yeah, contradictions are uncomfortable, right? You know, you that's a, that's, a, that's an uncomfortable feeling to contradict something. It absolutely <laughs> is. You know, it's you, you get this inter inner turmoil. You think, wait, I've heard yeah. this before, but now I'm hearing completely different information. You get uncomfortable yeah. and you don't know, well, what's true? What's false? How do I how do I know? <laughs> you know and that requires you to really dig deep, use your logic, look elsewhere to find more information. And a lot of people, when they get that feeling, it's it's too much work sometimes to figure out which one's right. So they just go with what they know and reject new information. It depends, everyone is different, but some people operate that way. And those who operate that way, whether probably unintentionally perpetuate myths that, mm -hmm. are, that might be completely untrue, simply because if someone's saying something that, you, that no one believed previously, you know, that's, it takes a while for these ideas to actually uh, enter into mainstream society if they ever do right. it at all because many don't you know yeah but and it's and a lot of times they're, they're really really technical things that you wouldn't even know are true and, and you wouldn't even look into because it's it's just so commonly known quote quote known you know that by people and the society is very very strong to believe the things that they want to believe it's the same same thing throughout history or learning about history or about business um it's easy to kind of speculate about big companies and Apple and Starbucks and Google because we all kind of want to be part of the, you know, the big companies we want to know what's going on in the world and people are just easy, easily sold and gullible and believe a lot of everything. So hopefully we can change that for certain people with regard to languages. What do you think? I think we absolutely can. So <laughs> before we start to though, uh, and I think, I have my reasons for doing this, and I'm, I'm sure you do as well, but I, I'd love to hear them. Why is it important to bust these myths, you know, to, to bust them, to bust them, you know, to be myth busters? <laughs> Why is that important in your view? Well, like I was saying before, you know, it's, it's really important to question as time goes on, you know, and we've, we're learning more about the field of you know, language instruction and, and language learning that we kind of question things that we thought were true or that we know as truths in the past. I think that's the case. I think people should do that for every field to always kind of stay up on best practices, we call them, to stay up on, you know, what's, what's working, what's actually still true from before, and just to see 
maybe if there's a way to make this process a little bit easier to change our perspective on it, because in most cases, you know, learning a language, it, it requires a little bit of going outside of that comfort zone, believing things that might not be true and uh, trying it out, sounding different. And, and if you're, if that feeling is initially given for the wrong reasons, you know, believing something that's not actually true about languages and, and changing the way you practice or the habits that you're forming, it could really affect you negatively in, in, the, long, in the long run because and you could have known that that's not actually a thing. That's not even true, <laughs> what you were doing, what, what you were practicing. So we're trying to save people time and money in the end, right, because of that, and to make the process more effective, more efficient, and, um, and, and maybe more fun just to realize how accessible it might be. Fantastic. What do you that's think? <laughs> I think that's completely true. And I, you know, I'll tie this back uh, to something. Hello, Ellie. So I'll tie this back to something that you mentioned earlier, which is as you learn more languages, you begin to, it becomes easier and easier. And that's because you start to learn these strategies that work, you know, that make, that make learning languages so much more of a thing that anyone can do. There's actually a myth that relates yeah. to this we can talk about later. But yeah, it's so important to do mm -hmm. because learning languages shouldn't be something that only a few people can have access to. Everyone should be able to learn a language. You want to learn a language, you should be able to do it. So Ali's calling in. Right. Let's uh, let him on. So welcome, yeah. Ali. Uh, Ali. Still loading here. Hi, Ali. How are you today? Hi, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear us? Great. So where are you right now? I am from Middle East. Now I am in Malaysia. Malaysia? Malaysia. Yeah. Wow. You're traveling? Are you living there? Studying? Working? Uh, study. Studying. Study. Yeah. Nice. Great. And you? Both of you. I... I am currently in Springfield, Massachusetts, in the United States. How about you, Ruben? I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan, oh. which is, uh, yeah, we're all very far away from each other. Well, you, Ali, are farther away from us than we are from each other, but definitely fun to be talking from different parts of the world. That's true. Yeah. So today we're talking about some language learning myths. So things that people think are true about learning languages, but in fact probably are not true. Do you know any, yeah. any myths or, or is there anything that you have been told that you don't actually believe relating to learning languages, Ali? No, I learn a lot of language now. I start to study English language now. Great. For how, how long have you been studying? For six months. Ali? But six, I want six to months, improve really? my accent. Yeah. Wow. Great. Great. Well, good for you. So how many languages do you speak? Yeah, uh, Arabic and English. Arabic okay. and English. Excellent. My mother, mother language is Arabic. Okay. Anyone Great. know any nice. words in Arabic or no? Yeah. Uh, shukran. Saida. Shukran. Afwan. Afwan. Yeah. Saida. Uh, I, I have one question. Why? I have one question. Why all like us? Ooh, I, I didn't hear that. Could you repeat your question, Ali? I think he doesn't have a very good connection. I wanted to answer his question, too. I wondered what it was. Yeah, I was really curious. <laughs> well, well, we'll hopefully I, he come back, comes back on. I have a question. Ali, can you hear it? What's that? I have a question which actually relates to what you just mentioned, Ruben, that we're all in different places. Do you have to live abroad to learn a language? What do you think, Ruben? Oh, wow. Uh, no. That's my, my <laughs> I think that's a big myth, right? That's I think that um, I'm doing that right now. I'm living in the United States after a few years of living abroad. And I continue, I'm actually started starting a new language, in fact, that uh, of a country I've never been to. In fact, the, I went to Brazil uh, with with you, Sam, if you mm -hmm. recall, uh, the whole the whole yes, year last year, and, and uh, we 
And I spoke Portuguese before I, I had ever been to Brazil. That's great. And not extremely well, but definitely well enough to establish a base. And, and going there helps, sure. But um, I would say that I, I, I claim that I spoke Portuguese still. Um, and I'd never been to a, lang a country who spoke it natively. And um, I think it's very possible. Same thing with Spanish for me, too. Yeah. In my case, I, I learned I learned Spanish in a Spanish-speaking country. However, I did the same thing. I learned Portuguese before I went to Brazil. Of course, I, I improved mm -hmm. a lot when I was there. But I but I arrived at the point where I could have real conversations and you know hold my own and survive um, before I got there. And how many before. languages do you speak? Yeah, I'm on number five. Arabic, it's no, one wish. of them. I wish. No. Why? Why we are Arab? We. I know. Why is that? And we. Little bit of from Europe or uh, USA don't want to learn Arabic because the Arabic it's have more population than the world. You know, one. Is it good? Yeah, it's one of the most popular in the more. world. Why don't more people learn Arabic? Yeah. I think I have a I have a partial answer, and I would love to learn Arabic. By the way, I would too. Um, I think that there's uh, a lot of variation with Arabic across the well, Arabic speaking world, from you know Morocco all the way to you know Iran, kind of, even farther to mm -hmm. Pakistan, perhaps. But like the the idea of of learning a language um, comes with a lot of cultural things too, and so that's sometimes um, it's sometimes really hard to access countries that are far away from people. You know, of course, flying to Northern Africa or to the Middle East um, to, you know, traditional study abroad and that kind of thing is maybe less common for people in the United States. But I think it's a great language. I've learned a couple of words here and there. I think it's fun to try to practice. Um, but it's, it's hard. It's a hard language, too, because of the alphabet, I think, is a big scare. People scare, are scared yeah, of the yeah. alphabet, a new alphabet. You know, also, also we are Arabic. We cannot speak, mm -hmm. yeah. especially in Arabic. You know, also when I was, yeah, I don't know how to do that. Mm, okay, uh, like the, the Quranic, Arabic. Quranic Arabic. Yeah, are, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and I think another reason yeah. why there aren't more Europeans and Americans learning Arabic is well, part of it has to do with, like Ruben said, it's difficult. Well, it's more just that it's it's difficult for people from a different language group. You know, yeah. uh, it's not that Arabic is inherently more difficult. It's just that it's more difficult from people who speak a very different language. And I think it's very common for people in people in especially Western Europe and in the United States to learn Western European languages first. And then from there, maybe learn mm -hmm. a few others. But the amount of people learning Arabic, at least in the United States, is increasing. It is becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. But Western European languages are still the number one thing people study. You know, everyone wants to yeah. learn English, Spanish, German, French. And those Lame. Are, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. <laughs> you look at the numbers in terms of population, it doesn't make sense that more people don't right. learn Arabic. But like I said, that is changing. And we will see a different future ahead, I believe. So. Yeah, that would be nice. Speaking of which, actually, I, I mentioned another another myth that I I I should have rephrased it. I should have actually asked it, asked it as a question. But what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah. Is are some languages inherently more difficult than others? What do you guys think? Nice. We got Carlton here now. Yeah. Hey oh, guys. Yes. Good Welcome, morning. Carlton. Nice. What's going on, Carlton? Uh, not too much. How y'all doing? We're doing great. Doing we great. Can't see your face though. No, this is think of me like Wilson on Tool Time. Okay. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's awesome. We, we can see your hands. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm here. I, no, I, you were is mentioning it? it, so I just thought, just as a curiosity, right? Just because a lot of times people don't, you know. Mm. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, there are. I, I think you know. I'm just starting to learn Arabic, and I'm just I don't. You know, um, but I, I think it is interesting. I think languages are fascinating, and I, and I, and um, I guess to address your your most recent question, I, I, of the languages that I know, I think even though it's my native language, I would say English is probably one of the more difficult languages to learn or to get a handle on, at least for pronunciation, simply because 
um, it, it is so ad hoc. I mean, it, it's 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 not like you can spell the word, you can pronounce it like it is in Spanish. Um, mm-hmm. right. You know, everything is a one off. And so you have to memorize all these individual words and there really are no rules or guidelines to follow. It's true. Yeah. You know, um, one of when I was in Brazil, actually, a professor I was working with who was a, an English professor, he, he likes to say that Portuguese is a language of rules with a few exceptions. English is a language of exceptions, exceptions. with a few rules. It's, that is, it's so true. It really is. Yeah. I mean, my wife is from Colombia, so, so Spanish is her native language. And, okay. you know, this is probably her biggest problem here is, is just being able to look at a word and have no idea how to pronounce it or vice versa, hearing the word and having wow. no idea how it's really spelled. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. In terms of reading and writing, that does actually make English more difficult. And, you know, studies actually show if well, you mentioned your wife from Colombia. So we'll, we'll say we'll talk about Spanish and English comparing. Yeah. So statistically speaking, it's very common for children to take longer to learn how to read English than Spanish. And rates of dyslexia are higher with, among English speakers than among Spanish speakers. That's interesting. Because in Spanish, you know, if you see a word, you know exactly how to pronounce it. They're, everything, all words follow the same linguistic pattern. Right. With English, if, if, I, if I look up a random word in the dictionary I've never seen before, I can guess I might be right, but I'm not necessarily going to be right. With Spanish, which I, I don't know nearly as many, I speak Spanish very well, but I don't know nearly as many words in Spanish. I cannot guarantee that I will, or I can guarantee that I will pronounce a Spanish word per- correctly. I cannot necessarily yeah. guarantee that I will, English, will pronounce an English well, I, word correctly. We, we you know? joking with my wife, you know, and I, I was a stand-up comic that did a routine on this, you know, but it was like T-O-M-B is tomb, C-O-M-B yeah. is comb, B-O-M-B yeah. is bomb. I mean, there's no yeah. there's no rhyme or reason here. Um, so, you know, what about this one? Uh, daughter and laughter. Yeah. yeah. It, it, there, that was one of the, I was going over my head. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, how 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 are people how are people mastering this language <laughs> with all these uh, weird exceptions? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's sort of funny. We say, you know, we say iron, you know, and I was like, yeah, the R is silent when you write it. It it, it or you know when you say it. it's it's um, yeah, we have we have all kinds of weird things like that. Um, but I do find, and and I don't know what the if you guys are linguists, uh, maybe you can shed some light on this because I'm not sure what the statistics are. What what percentage of languages globally, or at least common languages globally, are are gender specific? You know, they have gender mm-hmm. articles um, where, where we don't have this in English, but we do it, for example, in Spanish. You know, we have la and we have el. And it seems to be common in Romance languages. Um, mm-hmm. what, what other languages is that common in? Semitic languages also have uh, language gender. In fact, they have, you know, in, in uh, Hebrew and Arabic, it's not a, just, just that inanimate objects have a gender. A table is a female, etc. Yeah. But the verb, the verbs also change depending on who you're referring to. Yes. If you're a if you're a guy or a girl, right? As you probably know, studying Arabic, you'll say I eat differently than a girl, a female would. Would say I eat. Yes. Uh, and so that's the same for objects. But that that takes it to another level that some people who are learning Latin languages wouldn't uh, have to worry about. Do you think, but there are also variations on that too. Do you think there's yeah, a difference? Is it more difficult to learn a language? where they do not have gender and you're used to it or is it more difficult to add gender to your uh, to your database of, of of words and vocabulary i think it probably depends on the language too because in the case of german for example hmm. it's uh there are, there are also neutral things they're feminine masculine and new neut- and neuter neuter you know? right um and also with a language like spanish if you look at a word so 99 percent of the time with a spanish word you know the gender just by looking at the word French word, not true at all. You know, French word, it's it's not doesn't follow the same patterns. You know, most in in Spanish, like you have words that end in a are usually feminine, and words that end in o are usually masculine. Almost all the words that end in a and are actually masculine are masculine for a reason. You know, like el problema is masculine right. because all pretty much all words that end in in M A like that come from Greek and are masculine in Greek, so they continue to be mas- masculine uh, in Latin and then continue to be masculine in Spanish because yeah. of that. Oh, yeah. But um, and so in terms of in Spanish, I would say gender. You know, it's it's a little hard at first to get your mind around it, but once you understand how it works, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. Well, actually, how did English how did English end up without gender? I mean, it's a Germanic language, so you'd think it would mm-hmm. have, you know, that 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 would have flowed, um, you know, down to us, but apparently. Yeah. 
Well, not all Germanic languages have gender. Some do, some don't. You know, oh. German itself does, but uh, mm. English isn't actually descended from German. It's des right. descended from Old English, which is Anglo-Saxon, which is, you know, it's it's Germanic. It's related. It had, it's they, related have, yeah. they have common origins, but it's not ancestor, actually. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Common ancestor. But because of that, it's hard to know. You know, I mean, I'm not a historical linguistic, li or sorry, a historical <laughs> linguist. I know some, but I don't specifically know why English does not have gender i believe that english never had gender I, gender right. i don't believe old english has gender either huh. so that's probably why so when you know when norman french entered or mixed with old english to create middle english which then eventually created modern english there was never gender at any time at any point all of yeah okay. at any point in as far as i know in english's history so and that's just how it is you know some languages have it some don't but yeah. in terms of uh there are there are definitely I would say dozens of languages that have gender and dozens of languages that don't. So I don't know if it's 50, 50 exactly, but it's very common. I, I do. I, there's other things. I think I'd seen somewhere, uh, Ruben, I think it was on your profile. I'm not sure. Let me do something about yeah, pronunciation. Um, yeah. When we're in the United States, for example, there, there, and I don't know if this is just individually specific or this depends on country of origin, but there are people, mm -hmm. for example, who've lived here for 30 years or 40 years and spoken English for 30, 40 years. They still have a very heavy accent from their <laughs> native language, yeah. right? Typically, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I, I'm not trying to make generalizations, but at least in my experience, um, you know, people from Asian countries, China in particular, that, that accent seems to follow them forward. Um, but then I've met oh, yeah. other people. Uh, one of my bosses was, was – um, Persian from Iran. Um, mm -hmm. And even though he spoke Farsi, it was fluent. That was his native language. When he spoke English, you would never know that he wasn't from the United States. I mean, he had clearly no accent at all that I could mm -hmm. ever distinguish. Um, so some That's people great. seem to be far more successful at, at integrating the sounds of a new language. Is, is this a function of, of hearing acuity? Is it a function of the, the original language or how many new sounds there are in the new language? What, what comes to play in this? It's a great question. That's a great question. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll start. We can, sure we can both have, we both have insights here to yeah. answer. I feel like, you know, it's maybe a combination too of, of an ear uh, similarities with other languages, but also I would say that, um, you know, we, we've been talking about at the beginning of this lab, we talked about how, you know, people, the reason why myths exist is people don't really start to question their their methods and their practices and what ends up happening in a lot of foreign countries especially with larger populations you know india brazil um, and certainly in the middle east that when you learn english as a second language you start to have non-native teachers inevitably you just it's really hard to to get americans or uk australians whatever your name native english speakers in the classroom and so it's not necessarily just about the fact that they can't acquire a, an accent, a native-like accent. It's, it's sometimes the resources available to them. If they think that their teacher is speaking English with a perfect accent uh, and they're imitating and emulating this, this teacher, uh, surely it kind of snowballs and it starts this, really, a, a, another dialect like we have in India, Indian English, yeah. which is an official language of India, right? It's actually, they're speaking their native language in most cases, and we're just like, I don't understand what you're saying. Can you, you know, can you speak English? It can, it's got to be really frustrating. Uh, and we were, uh, Sam and I spent some time in Brazil teaching, and, and there is definitely such thing as Brazilian English, and people yeah. speak in a really consistent way, and they don't question it because it's, it's for them, it's really, it's correct. It's the way that everybody speaks, and it's weird to try and to go out of your, you know, to, it's not cool to, to sound good. It's kind of a paradox. I always say this, like a bad, uh, a bad accent is a good accent Ooh. to them. You know, it's, it's like a weird, well, they're, like, they're like, matching what they know, so it makes sense. Right, you know? sure. Well, is that is that true? I mean, okay, so clearly, uh, Japanese people seem to have problems with the letter R, mm -hmm. um, and yet when. Uh, when you say it for them, I'm thinking of a friend of mine that I have that's from Japan. He's trying to learn English. When I say it for him, he clearly thinks he's repeating what he's hearing, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. He doesn't. It, it. He doesn't say the word and then go, "Oh my God, that was terrible." He actually thinks that it matches, but it, in fact, yeah. it's not even close. You know, when it comes to the letter R, um, is there a reason behind that? Yes. So, okay. This. This. So again, the myth we're talking about here. 
overall, I would say, well, there are two. One is that moving to a different country will automatically make you learn perfectly. And another is that if you have an accent now, you will always have an accent or that it is impossible to learn a native accent or a, a convincingly close to, or an accent convincingly close to a native one. So some of that can be simply, he hasn't trained his ear enough to be able to hear the difference, or he hasn't trained his, his mouth enough to be able to make the sound difference. And some of that actually comes from learning wrong in the first place, you know, which, which is, it's very common to do. Almost everyone who learns a language learns at least a little bit incorrectly at first, because you try to imitate these sounds and your mouth can't quite make them perfectly yet and your ear can't quite hear them perfectly yet because you're not used to them. The more you hear them, if you continue to work on and improve your pronunciation and make that uh, you know, a concerted effort and work with people who are trained to help you recognize the difference between those sounds, you can achieve these differences in sound. In the case of the, the example you're talking about with someone who's, who's Japanese having trouble with L and R, chances, chances are this particular person learned, when this person learned English, they didn't spend very much time differentiating between L, L and R, and it got to the point where they just developed habits and they, in which they kind of pronounced them both the same way and continued to do that. And every single time they spoke, they perpetuated that habit and they, they, you know, they made it easier and easier and easier to say it incorrectly. So something that's important to do is destroy what you know, you know, knock down the building and, and build a new one. Sometimes if you really want to sound like a native speaker, you gotta, you gotta take a wrecking ball to your knowledge of language sometimes and well, start no. from the ground up. How important is that? Okay, because you know it, people that are that are that are, that are learning a language for the first time, especially, you get told maybe conflicting get conflicting advice. So you know sometimes you sit in the classroom and the person will say, "Don't worry about your pronunciation. Just just say the sentence, say the word, do whatever." And then on the other side of the coin, I think pronunciation is important I, I, and, mm -hmm. and i'm i'm trying not to go too far I, i'll give you an example my wife is from colombia right when mm -hmm. she came to the united states she could read and write english but she's kind of shy about speaking so when she came here she says well you know when i get there i'll take a class i'll i'll get more comfortable speaking well this is 10 years later we still speak spanish in the house all day so you know and i and i failed it twice in high school so you know but <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I mean it is kind of important, and I don't know what your how you what your take is on this, right? We hear people that speaking English as a second language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I got a comment on this. I'm sorry, it's a sidebar. But yeah. <laughs> when, when we see people in the states that are trying to learn to speak English and they don't do it correctly, our tendency as Americans is to make fun of them or to speak louder at them, as though that helps yeah. at some level. Right. Yeah. Um, and yet when I went to Colombia and my Spanish was horrific, it was, you know, hola and chao. And that was about it. Um, it. Nobody did that. They bent over backward. They were they were so happy that I was learning Spanish. They bent over backward to help me. Um, yeah. and so it's a very different um, um, mindset. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm getting off topic. But how important is accent yeah. is, was sort of the fundamental question. I know what Ruben's going to say. <laughs> well, I'll just tell you that, Carlton, you know, this is a, a part of my my daily activity, which is working with pronunciation. I help language learners of all sorts uh, master their pronunciation. I'm an advocate of it because for me personally, it's, uh, it's, it's a way to, to kind of feel confident, to, to feel really confident when it comes to speaking with, with new people. It's always a, a factor when, it, when you're working in a foreign language, when you're living in a different country, you're constantly reminded that you are not from there or people ask you to repeat yourself and where you're from. Um, and it, it kind of just drains. I mean, for, for me, and I know a lot of people that I've worked with, it just, it, it's, it's as, as simple as, Oh, I don't really feel like confident. And it goes to, to the extreme of, I can't get that promotion because they're not, you know, they don't feel confident with my abilities to, to work with clients or other colleagues face to face. And it, it really depends on how what your your use of the language is. If you're just traveling and you're trying to you know have a conversation or two while, while on vacation, I don't think it's nearly as, as important. But you're right; people will definitely feel flattered and and definitely uh, you know react in a positive way 
in mo most other countries more so than they would to an American receiving, you know, someone speaking English, even if it's, uh, you know, close to perfect, we still find the, the flaws, right? Um, but it's it's about the confidence, it's in, and it's showcasing your ability with the language in the first 10 seconds. That first impression that you make is often the, the representation of your overall language ability. So if you have a thick accent, but you're on paper grammatically perfect and your vocab stellar, your identity to somebody who has just met you is, well, you got a thick accent though. When you're speaking, right, that's the first thing that comes out. That's what people are, are, are kind of gauging as the type of speaker that you are. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all of that is very is very true. I completely second everything Ruben said. It actually it really upsets me when when teachers say, "Oh, don't worry about the pronunciation," because <laughs> just like what I was saying, well, you, know, you develop bad habits now, they will continue to be bad habits for a long time. So a, a lot of the time, that happens because language classes very frequently, in a lot of cases, especially in the education system in the United States, that's at least what I'm most familiar with. There are these huge language classes of 30 people, of even 20 people. And there is absolutely no time to work on individual pronunciation with students. And so people slip through the cracks and because it's, you know, it's a lot easier to correct grammar on paper on tests. So teachers do that and they just let the pronunciation go. And sometimes the teachers don't know pronunci no correct pronunciation perfectly. So they don't feel like they have the expertise to work on that, but really they should be. That's why I, I always prefer to teach small groups or individual classes, private classes when possible, so that yeah. you can give exactly what each particular student what it should sound like. Situation, well, you know? it, and it's, so if you learn it right in the beginning, you don't have to ever learn it again. And like, like Ruben said, you have that confidence and you are able to form real meaningful relationships that will allow you to continue to practice your language skills and have yeah. real conversations with people. Um, you, so, sorry, I think I interrupted you. Go ahead, Carlton. No, no, that was okay. I was, I was me. I, I, a little ADD coming out there. Um, <laughs> how do you address the, the question then? So, or do other, may I should say, do other languages have the same issue? When, when we're talking about, at least in America, when we're speaking English, we seem to have an overabundance of fluidity in terms of how we pronounce our own words, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even to the point sometimes of, of, of transposing letters. You know, the person who says ax instead of ask mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And and we don't correct people in our own country that do this wrong. So what do you say to the person who's trying to learn English? Um, do you just say that they're both right and just model whoever your instructor is? Are you more strict with people who are trying to learn English in terms of their pronunciation than you would be with a native speaker? Well, I always, I'll say that I always try to help people sound natural. When I say natural, I mean colloquial and not necessarily choosing a dialect, like you're talking about African-American vernacular English, perhaps, or an and accent maybe, from the Northeast. Yeah, from the Northeast or Boston or right, wherever, exactly. I think that, first of all, it's really hard to get to that point where you're able to distinguish those. Mm -hmm. I've had a student, I have lots of students who've asked me this, but one in particular has said, hey, Ruben, they have Ruben, Ruben, uh, do I have an American accent or a British accent? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I man. Said, uh, you have, you got an Argentine accent, man. Yeah. You have neither of those. Yeah. You, know, you don't have. <laughs> it's so uh, you know, like, it's 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 really funny too because you're like, well, in grammatically, you know, there, or vocabulary wise, there's certain differences between UK mm -hmm. and, and American sure. North American English, but to be able to pinpoint, you know, the accent, to be able to imitate an accent at a you know beginner or intermediate stage is. It should be a focus, like we're talking about. Sam mentioned practicing pronunciation early on, mm -hmm. but you know the New York, New England accents or the Southern accents, I would say, are really harder, a lot harder to to show that you're to regionalize that that, that accent. Um, and it's kind of nice to focus on a standard practice. And there are ways to help you sound more. Uh, when, when you were talking about miss, uh, you, or sorry, uh, different appropriation of letters, I, I was thinking of like going to becoming gonna yes. or wanna and these kind of phrases that we say all the time and i think that most learners shy away from those types of phrases because they consider it slang or informal or inappropriate yeah. even hmm. whereas we we you hear the president and and pol politicians and people that are you know eloquent speakers 
using those because it's not about slang. It's mostly a rhythm, a rhythm and a natural rate of speech. There is, and, and, things, and that's one of the things that I've always found fascinating about languages is that there seems to be a, a, a distinct musical quality to different oh, yeah. languages that Absolutely. even if you have no vocabulary in that language at all, I can still recognize it simply from the flow, simply from the, the, the intonation of the language. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I do this just for fun because obviously this is, she is, she is from Colombia. She speaks Spanish. I'm learning it, but we can watch a YouTube video and she can immediately say, Oh, they're from Ecuador. They're from Venezuela. They're from Argentina. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. from Puerto Rico. They're from the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic. You know, it's I am crazy. 10 years later, I'm still trying to hear that difference. Um, yeah. You know, some of them are more obvious than others, but you know, Absolutely. but it does take time. Yeah. Is is? I hope you don't mind all my questions. By the way, this, no, this is, they're great. They're fantastic yeah. questions. What about? And this is something that's plagued me my whole life. I like learning languages. I don't have a problem learning alphabets, learning vocabulary. I don't have too much of a problem. I don't think with pronunciation. Um, when I put my mind to it, I have an extraordinarily, I have an extraordinary problem in terms of receptive skills. Mm. While I can go. I can I could go to South America. I feel perfectly comfortable with my vocabulary, although my my I, I will say my grammar is pretty pitiful. Um, everything's in the present tense for the most part. But nonetheless, but I can make myself understood. Right. Mm -hmm. But when someone speaks back to me, 99 percent of the time it goes in one ear and out the other. I can't. My brain wants mm -hmm. to slow the sentence down because I can't. It, it takes me a while to identify the words. And by then, of course, the speech is long gone. Um, mm -hmm. Are these two separate skills in terms of how you go about um, addressing or getting better at each of them? Yes, I would say so. I mean, they're connected. Everything related to the language is connected. You know, you can't have you can't have words without grammar and pronunciation. You know, you can't you can't really you sure you can just isolate exercises, but in terms of communication, everything is connected in one way or another. I mean, so in terms of improving your ability to understand what people are saying when they speak to you. So some of that actually can be recognizing local accents because, you know, in, in a Spanish class, you'll probably learn, um, yo tengo un problema in a very neutral accent, in a very like, in, a, in an accent that doesn't really sound like it's from anywhere specific. But the way people talk in different ways will kind of sometimes make it sound mumbled make it sound rushed, or in, in Argentina they would say, yo tengo un problema, you know, their voices go up and down and up and down. No, and pero boludo, tenés un problema? Bueno, boludo, decime, you know. por favor. Or, um, but yeah, so the thing is, recognizing local accents can actually help with that because you start to realize, oh, in this country, when a word ends with S, they don't say the S. So chances are he's actually saying los problemas, not lo problema, you know? And so sometimes little things like that can help you. Person, everyone is different in terms of figuring out strategies that work for them. The important thing is to find out what works for you. One thing that helps for me, I'm a very visual person and I'm seeing words, like seeing a word written really helps me. So when people are talking to me, this sounds crazy, but often I, in my mind's eye, see a script. I just <laughs> transcribe everything in my mind. I don't know why, but for some reason my mind works that way. Um, sometimes, and that, that helps me a little because then you can differentiate sounds and words because sometimes, hmm. especially with, with Spanish, you know, there are only five vowel sounds and there, because of that, sometimes you get situations in which the end of one word flows, flows into, the, into the next word, into right. the next one. And, and it makes it sound like the two are the same word. And sometimes the two can be combined to make that exact same word with a different meaning. So it's, it's hard to know which one you mean. You have to, I guess, use context clues to figure that out. And again, there are many different strategies, but the more you do it, the easier it will get. Mm. So having done it for 10 years is great and that helps. But my question for you is, how have you gone about doing it for 10 years? You know, because that matters too. It's not just doing it for a long time, but how you do it, how consistently, all of that. So how have you done it for 10 years? Hmm. Escuchando a los, la, las novelas en TV. 
um, uh, Walter Mercado en los, y, y las estrellas y, y, y tre, le, tres mujeres y lente loco <laughs> y sabado gigante. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, all, all the bad ways. So you know, when I when my wife got here, right, it was it was literally you know listening to as many Shakira records as I could get my hands on. Um, <laughs> then it, then it went to you know tan, uh, Spanish television and, and the novelas and then um, you know of course when she got here it's and and this is probably a good thing and a bad thing right i i think when you're married i can understand my wife all the time but i'm not sure that i really understand her as much as i know what she's going to say or i think i know because, because you cause, know her because there's yeah. a daily context right. and flow to our lives you know sure. so i kind of know when she comes up to my room at 12 o'clock she's going to ask me something about lunch i mean it's not that bad i mean i do understand what she's saying but but yeah there there is um, <laughs> your vocabulary sort of gets limited you know and stuff but we try to branch out i mean that's one of the things that i do try to do is i try to have conversations with her about philosophy about religion about politics about work, great. programming uh simply to broaden my vocabulary um even yeah. if I don't get it exactly right, I can usually get myself uh, known. Now, when we when we argue, you know, here we are, Ricky and Lucy, yeah, um, you know, it turns into that a little bit, you know. Uh, her Spanish, you know, goes full throttle, you know, um, mm -hmm. which means, okay, I just know you're angry. You know, every now and then I'll pick out a noun <laughs> and I go, okay, something about the trash. Did I take out the trash? And, <laughs> and you know, and vice versa. Um, but, see, but like Arabic, but Arabic is a very different thing for me because Arabic is yeah. I don't I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I can count the number mm -hmm. of Arabic native yeah. Arabic speakers on one finger, and there aren't any. Yeah. Um, so I have nobody to practice this with. We don't get a lot of you know television you know from Egyptian television stations here. Um, oh. So they're really outside of music. There really is very little to hear, and the occasional person who I'm 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 about to <laughs> be right that, that's on blab, you know. Yeah. So when I when I count to ten, right, when I go, <laughs> you know, is that right? Is that not right? I don't know. When yeah. you talk to people on blab, um, yeah. I get varying comments. And again, depending where in the Arab world they're from. So the person who is Egyptian will say, ah, no, you know. Hamsa is more mm. like this. It's not like that. If I get somebody from Morocco, it's very different. If I get somebody from, you know, Palestine, it's different yet again. So, no. oh, so, hi. Hi, Hajar. Hello, Hajar. Uh, Welcome. About, thanks a lot. It's about accents. So, uh, in yes. Every, yeah. yes, in every country in the Arabic, I mean, um, maybe more in my town, just in my town, the, maybe you you will find fifty accents or or more. So wow. you have to learn standard Arabic. We can say standard Arabic, which all Arabic understand it, and you will be understood if you speak with it. So mm -hmm. uh, I advise you to not speak. Uh, learn Arabic. Uh, learn an accent Arabic. Learn the standard Arabic. I would okay. I would argue. Great point. Carlton, I would I would argue the best thing to do is to actually learn both. Learn standard and pick a particular location. Whatever interests you the most, if you're likely to travel there, for example, or if yeah. you know someone, I know you said in your particular city there aren't any native speakers. But yeah, let's say you have a family this friend or something comment. that right. lives in a different city, or if there's if there's some connection you have to some Arabic speaking country, I would say pick that and learn that mm -hmm. local dialect in addition to standard Arabic. Because that way, when you go there, when you have interactions with these people, you can do so in a more real, kind of friendly, person-to-person, -person, human interaction way. You know, here's the only thing. So, that I... like, for... oh, sorry, God, Sam, uh, my bad. So, for for example, it's okay. Uh, for example, with with Spanish, so I learned Paraguayan Spanish first. Mm. Then I, um, because I, I lived in Paraguay for a year. Then I lived in. Nicaragua for a few months and I lived in Spain for a few months. So my, so my accent kept actually changing because I tried to always match the local accent. The more you do that, the more you can have a real kind of, like I said, real meaningful relationship with these people that you're interacting with every day, which is which is really important for your own happiness if you're living abroad. I, I've noticed, now, inter oh, sorry. I, sorry I always do that, sorry, Sam. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, it, it, the, only, the only downside I think to having a good accent, and it's, it's trivial, but it, I think the, 
the better your accent is, the more likely initially that you might be mistaken for a native speaker or somebody who's fluent. And that's not a downside. It, that's nobody. It, it, it can it can totally be when you're new. It can be when you're new. You know. So oh, so if yeah, I can yeah. say Wonderful. so if I can, I, you know, it, I, if I can say you know Mahavan in a way that sounds like somebody who you know speaks Arabic native, we would say it. The other person then immediately rattles off three hundred paragraphs, and I am. I am left way yeah. in the dust. Whereas if 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 I, if it was said sort of in a I don't want to say an Americanized way, but with it without an accent, then people recognize yeah. you're learning the language and sometimes. But that's a trivial thing because you can always correct them, yeah. you know, which I usually do when they get down. I'm like, yeah, no, okay, we need to roll the tape back and yeah. start again slower. Um, but uh, it was the same. I went to Gallaudet for a while. And I learned sign language for a while, and. Um, Oh. It was it was the same cool. it was the same it was the same there you know and and ironically even in sign language there are accents and depending on where the person lives the signs will change and will adjust. Cool. Um, so cool. I think one of my most traumatic uh, the things not really traumatic but when I was I was there eating breakfast uh, yeah. it was a Gallaudet and I was I was a new student and I I knew sign language I really you know, I was I was learning it. But I'm standing there, and of course, with sign language, unlike spoken language, I can eavesdrop from across the room. So there's there's somebody farther down line, and I'm watching these two girls talk, and I'm going, "What that?" And I'm and it's like I'm ba- it's like my brain switched off. I was like, I'm watching them. I'm going, but I don't understand anything. But I should understand this, and I couldn't forget. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I asked the person next to me. I said, "Why can't I'm not understanding what what the hell are they saying?" And she went, "Oh, they're Canadian." Oh, so sign language is totally different in Canada than it is in the U.S. It's a different language. So also, it's, it's kind of fascinating. It's true. Did I just talk well, I would, to a poor friend off? <laughs> it, I, I, think, I think she doesn't have the best connection, unfortunately. Mm. I, to go back to what you were saying before, it yeah. is frustrating to have to ask people to repeat. But put, putting yourself outside of your comfort zone, challenging yourself to try to understand them when they go off and say four paragraphs will make you mm. better at the language in the long run. You know, it's... Struggle a little more now, but the Get payoff later. is much higher. You know, it's it's really, really, really worth it. I know it's learning a language isn't always just comfortable, lovey dovey. You know, soft and easy, and and the kind of thing that you would want to do on your day off when your brain isn't working. Well, you should on your day off when your brain isn't working because <laughs> you should every day. At least that's what I say. But. But anyway, my point is, it can be hard, you know, and sometimes that's a good thing. Hard isn't necessarily bad. What do you think yeah. about all that, Ruben? I was just going to say that like, I, I, have, I was loving the comments and talking about these things because it, it just reminds me of all these, you know, instances that we've experienced abroad and, and as we've gone through different stages of different languages, too. It seems like we all have experience with at least two or three or four or five. Um, but that I agree with Carlton. At the beginning stages, it sucks to be, like, speaking what we think is well and and not having to be able not being able to understand i mentioned here like if you know how to say how much does it cost with perfect arabic or you name your language and then they come at you with all the numbers and you haven't learned the numbers yet you're like uh well i know (laughs) that i'm sure it sounded decent but you know that's not really the most effective way of using the language when i learned i've learned two languages in particular that i've gotten more positive reactions from my pronunciation which are argentine argentine spanish and Hebrew, mm-hmm. and those two, I happen to have a face that goes with the the culture, the culture, which is nice and helpful. And so, when I start speaking, even the first few seconds, no one, you know, uh, bats an eye to it to the difference between what I, what I'm trying to say. And and the thing is, I I personally like to do that. I think it's kind of a fun game. I also think it's flattering when when you know people hear their own accent. And when Sam was saying. You know, find a specific one. You know, you really can relate. I agree with that. Um, but also, people in Hebrew, for example, I'm not really, I'm not fluent, fluent, but I, you know, it's conversational. Yeah. I kind of gauge my level and that ability by how long it takes people to to figure it out. Or uh, I know I can go one minute strong, but like two, three minutes, they're gonna find out anyway. And I'm not, tr- yeah. I don't, ca- I'm not trying to hide my my nationality or anything. Dude, no. It's just kind of a, a way to relate to people and say, hey, you know, I was I was going strong. I, I can I can imitate it, and it sounds pretty good. But I'm not an I'm not a native speaker. No, I, I, I think my wife and I do that sometimes too. She speaks English, and accent aside, 
right? Sometimes she'll speak English and I, she'll, she has a business. And, and so mm -hmm. in, in the course of this business, she needs to write, respond to emails to customers. And mm -hmm. so she'll have me occasionally, you know, proofreader, especially if it's more than a one liner. Right. And I'll, and I'll read it and I'll go, yeah. And she's like, what's wrong? I'm like, well, nothing is wrong. It's grammatically correct. The words are spelled right. It's just not the way somebody would say that thing. We wouldn't totally. use that phraseology to get it across. So it comes across as somebody who's foreign, who's learned, you know, English, yeah. you know, and I was like, just say it this way. It, it sounds better. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of get that. What about, I mean, this is really getting out of base a little bit too, but what about um, either language ancient languages where we have no pronunciation guide um or or synthetic languages like lojban or klingon for that matter oh, yes. or any of the other ones um um is, is it is it fair to say it doesn't matter pick pronounce it how you <laughs> like or are there do we develop standards even though we don't know if they're correct and use them anyway that's a really great question after we answer this we're going to have to Start moving towards wrapping this up. Because we're yeah. around. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that depends to a certain extent on an individual personal level as well, mm -hmm. because there are, you know, there are these uh, spoken Latin conversation groups, you know, which, right. and so if you want to fit in with them, that matters. And for, for example, for priests who read prayers in Latin, if they want to sound good, it matters, you know, mm -hmm. and there are actually two different standard pronunciations of Latin, one used by the church and one used by academia. Okay. Um, the, I be believe the biggest difference is with the way they pronounce soft C's or whether there are soft C's at all. So whether it's like a ch, like in Italian or a cup. Um, but uh, in terms of other dead languages, I, I don't know it as as much. I would say, like I said, it depends on the situation. In in the case of Sanskrit, which is another dead language, you know, there are a lot of prayers that people say. So I would say pronunciation matters, especially if something rhymes, then that helps you memorize this particular prayer. So there, there are definitely applications of, or there are ways to apply pronunciation to dead languages even. Even if you don't know everything about the pronunciation, and even if you don't pronounce it perfect, you're not going to go up and have a conversation with someone in that language probably. But there's still uses to, to having good pronunciation. What do, what do you think, Ruben? Do you think it's worth it? I want to say briefly that, you know, it's it's just like people individually don't have good accents in, in foreign languages. It's hard to just say, um, you know, that that's how it was spoken. I think it's one reason why we have an IPA, the phonetic alphabet, to, you know, to speculate and, and to see how certain languages have evolved and to, to make those, uh, those, I guess, inferences from the past and where it came from. But you're ultimately going to have limitations because of someone's native language. No, no. Uh, a, a common example is in Hebrew. There's a uh, there's modern Hebrew is a, a creation, basically, of, of stemmed from biblical Hebrew from the Torah. But the Jewish population around the world doesn't. Uh, sorry, it speaks in so many different countries and so many different ways um, that you you find now in Israel and Hebrew they have this like guttural R, almost like a French R, when they speak. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't, seemingly, wasn't the way that a biblical Hebrew was spoken. That French art comes from the Germanic, Yiddish, the Eastern European uh, wave of Jews who probably, of course, had no other uh, R sounds to use. And the German R kind of become, became now a standard in modern Hebrew practice. It's like being able to, uh, to speculate and even knowing the truth doesn't necessarily mean, even if you know the truth, doesn't mean it's how people put it into practice just like how we know languages today. It's like, we know what the real thing is, but everybody's doing it this way. So, well, what are you gonna do, fight them? It's really hard. Hmm. Interesting, yeah, well, I know, you, I know you gotta wrap up, Sam. Um, well, let's, I, let's I wrap it up. 500 more questions for next time. Okay, of course, we'd, <laughs> and we'd love to see you again. So let's wrap it yeah. up with um, a, few, a few quick myths that we didn't mention. So mm -hmm. one of the ones that I hear all the time is that only children can learn new languages. Oh yeah. So uh, something interesting about that is a lot of studies actually demonstrate that adults who have been taught the proper techniques actually learn languages faster than mm -hmm. children. Not just, you know, language people, which is that's a whole nother myth, the whole like, I'm not a language person or polyglots mm -hmm. are especially gifted. No, they're not. They've just learned some language hacks. Well, we, you know, we've just yeah. learned some tricks that work for us 
and help us learn faster and help us maintain and help us be able to master multiple languages. It's not a matter of us having all this extra time or a matter of us ha uh, you know, having special brains. You know, we're, we're normal people just like everyone else. It's just we've learned some tricks that work. And if you apply those tricks, pretty much anyone can learn a language. Like I've said, yeah. I've said it in the past in these conversations, I strongly believe that any person can learn any language as long mm -hmm. as, you know, any, anyone who, un unless they're disabled and unable to speak or, or there's some other complication like that that you absolutely cannot overcome. But your average person can learn any language as long as they have the proper resources, incentive, tools, methods, and it helps to have a teacher too. So what do you think about these myths? Or do you have any other myths, Ruben? Yeah, I was going to say, oh, just quickly, I think that uh, you're right, that uh, having being an adult and knowing your language well is, a, is the best way to, to go about starting. You know, like I would say as an ESL uh, teacher, I learned a ton more about my foreign languages as I acquired more knowledge about English grammar. And just to yeah. say, what are the names of stuff and how is that, how does that play into what I'm doing here in, in my Latin languages or what have you. Uh, I wanted to say one thing is that um, a myth I hear all, this, all the time or a myth, a statement I hear is that, but I do practice pronunciation, Ruben. I, I talk with my friends all the time. And this is more going along the lines of, well, are you talking or practicing? And, and the, the idea, there is a difference between practice and playing, right? It's like you don't, when you're having a conversation, uh, my take on this is that you're you're performing it's game time it's communication time and you don't have time to to work on your r's and your l's or your your guttural i in your, your arabic ah, ah. it's it's really you got to say it and so it's just like you don't uh i so say you don't change your tennis serve in the middle of the of, of the final round area you, know? you don't um you know don't change the, the practice i feel like language and and um in, in sports and, and physical activity are kind of the same thing because it's a form. And if you work on that form, and it, perhaps individually, that translates into how you play, how you speak, but just talking all the time, you know, being a conversationalist and being, being someone who's you know, gregarious and fun and, and has a personality doesn't mean that your pronunciation is getting better. It's just maybe you're even solidifying some of those bad habits from, from the past. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? So, uh, uh, a, f a final that's that's fantastic practice is essential and you know practice makes perfect i would say is a, is another myth um i i remember hearing once growing up practice makes permanent and i think that's much more true so again oh. if you're practicing incorrectly that will become permanent because you will be used to doing that you know this this yeah. goes back to the whole idea of incorrect pronunciation like the the japanese friend of yours carlton who has trouble with r's and that japanese person even if that person has has been practicing R's and L's, this person is pra probably practicing incorrectly. And so this incorrect pronunciation is ingrained in. Oh, I, I, yes. I mean, and I'll, and I, I mean, I'll give the pra a quick practical example, which is with my wife and I, when we're at home talking, right? 10 years later, she doesn't stop and correct me every time I make a grammatical mistake. She doesn't mm -hmm. care. She's, which mm -hmm. is which is nice that she understands me, but it's bad because I develop a bad habit because now yes. I think that is correct because no one stopped me to say that's wrong. So yeah, yeah. The, the difference between practicing and actually just doing it is you know is, is are very different things. That's true. And now the final final myth uh, to discuss. Well, I'll put I will ask it as a question, and I will let the two of you discuss it. <laughs> are translation tools good enough? What do you guys think? Go ahead, Ruben. Uh, no, I think uh, <laughs> I think it's really. I mean, I mean, it's getting it's getting closer. It's definitely great. I mean, I, I love it. I use them. Every, I mean, I think translation is inevitable. You have to translate stuff, you know. And so uh, we're moving forward. I think certain uh, applications are better than others, uh, but I just think that it's really hard as we even as we progress that language changes and that there are certain so many different nuances and homonyms and homophones and things where you have to um kind of gauge a sense and you know intonation plays a role there's so many factors that i believe we can get we can absolutely get to that point but it's identifying patterns and this is what i pre what i preach and what i teach all the time is that if you know all the if you know the patterns and you understand the system and it's basically, I, I imagine how these translation applications work is an algorithm to understand if this, then that, right? Yeah. And if they just need like a few thousand more 
you know, data points to say, okay, well, let's tweak it. I think it's getting better, but I don't think it's quite there yet. Well, yeah, and, and again, I think translation tools, well, I think we have a way to go. Um, you know, first of all, context is everything. So, and a lot of times translation tools don't have a good grasp of context. So if I'm talking and I'm saying he's yellow, do I mean do I mean he's scared or do I mean he has jaundice and it's a medical diagnosis? Um, yeah. You know, how do you know which which word do you pick? You know, if you say he's somebody's <laughs> green with envy, but does that really translate into another language if they don't associate the color green with 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 being envious? Would it make any sense? So yeah, yeah. I, I think I think tools have a ways to go. My wife and I, when we first dated, used translation because we, she was in Columbia, I was here, so it was electronic, you know, and I, we got into a few, um, we had a few misunderstandings um, so as a result, a as a result of Google. Awkward <laughs> situation created because of Google, yeah. They, they are, so yeah, they are improving, but they're still not good enough. I think they're great for entertainment, and they're mm -hmm. great in a pinch, and they're, they're yeah. a yeah. great starting point, but uh, they're, they're not there yet, and quite simply, trying to rely too heavily on them is, it's yeah. not just a matter of being lazy it's a matter of doing something incorrectly because and the worst part is again you might be learning the incorrect way of expressing something if you use the <laughs> translation tools and the translation tool is wrong you know something i i, I had I gave one of my students uh, about a month ago i told him google lies sometimes google's not always doesn't always tell the truth <laughs> and then and he realized i was right he had this epiphany he was like <gasps> Google isn't always right. Oh my, oh God. my God. Oh my God. Because, because he, so there's something he knew and Google Translate got it wrong. And he was like, oh, I know more than Google. And he felt so good about himself. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. So, and it, there are all these websites. If you, if you look this up on Google, like translation fails from, from Google Translate. It's, it's really entertaining sometimes. Oh, there's, um, there's, and, oh, there's, 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 there's a site you guys must know about. Uh, Omniglot. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful site. Um, I, every time I find somebody that speaks an unusual language that I've not heard before, I always want to see if they get the hovercraft and the eels, you know, sentence correct, you know, in that yeah. in Romanian or in, you know, whatever the language is. <laughs> yeah, That's it's awesome. interesting. All right. All right. Well, this has been a, a great discussion. Um, I think it's yeah, important it. to um, not use any of these myths as an excuse to not learn languages. Um, it's And it's important to be aware of these myths. And sometimes, you know, I'm sure there are myths that Ruben and I aren't even aware of because they're so right. deeply ingrained into the, the, you know, the study of language learning. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's important to vary your study techniques, learn from as many different sources as possible, ask yeah. a lot of different teachers, find out the truth, you know, the core of existence. Who knows? And maybe there isn't one truth. Maybe, I've, maybe there's, there are multiple truths, but I think it's important to have a variety of experiences, use a variety of sources and learn as much as you can from different places so that you can find out what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. So any, any final words, Ruben? Yeah, I'll just say that I'll mimic that and say that, you know, staying up to date with, with the language uh, makes it even more exciting and seeing what's around the corner and makes it like never, you can't get to that point where you just, okay, I got it. Now I can sit, sit on it. It's, it's a, it's a lifestyle. We know that it's not a language language is a, it's a skill, but it's also uh, a way of life in a lot of cases. If you're not living somewhere, you have to go out of your way to, to, you know, to acquire these things. And it's the best strategies, you know, involve, you know, the opposite of complacency. So we'll see, uh, see how that helps people. And thanks to everybody who joined today, Carlton, especially, mm -hmm. and Sam yeah, really had a great time and just, just awesome. Good stuff all around. Thanks for so thanks for having, having me. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone as well. It was really, really a great discussion. A lot of fun. And we won't be here next week, but happy holidays, everyone. And happy New Year. Yeah. And we will see you again in 2016. Yeah. Happy New Year, Sam. We'll see you next year. Sounds good. All right. Have a great day and a great holiday season, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.